Greetings in the precious name of Jesus. So glad to be together to worship this morning. What a privilege we have. Finally, it's come. You say what? The subject that I have for this morning is something that uh, originated years ago in Romania. A fellow minister had a message on it, and I always thought I'd want to preach on it. Got several books about it. It's been all these years. I haven't done it yet. But finally, it's come. That's what I want to do this morning. Title of the, less, uh, the message is Lessons from the Eagle. The other day when I was gathering grapes for my wife, I was out, and I think I've mentioned this before. I don't know exactly was it when I did that, but it seems to me I mentioned something, how that I was out and I noticed a bird up in the sky, and he's just flying back and forth and just gliding and going higher and higher and higher, and finally there's just a little dot. Could hardly see it anymore. Never fluttered one time. Just gliding. I had to think of an eagle. And then I discover my wife and Wendell said that we evidently have a bald eagle in our vicinity. Across the road in the swampy woods, We've seen it several times, or they've seen it several times, and I suppose, I'm presuming, I've probably seen it that day, going up and up. And it caused me to wish to be a bird, just, just float. But that's not really what God wants for his people, it's just float along. But anyhow, there's other thoughts that relate to an eagle and its way of flight. <clears throat> I'd like to turn this morning and read a few verses in Job this morning concerning an eagle. Job 39, verse 29. <clears throat> 39, verse 29. And there it says, I'm going to read... Begin reading in uh, verse 27, where it says, Doth the eagle mount up at thy command, and make her nest on high? She dwelleth and abideth on the rock, upon the crag of the rock, and the strong, any strong plains, from whence she seeketh the prey, and her eyes behold afar off. As far as I thought I'd read, there's another verse there. But... I notice that in those couple of verses there, it gives us some hints about the character of an eagle. Builds its nest up on high, um, mounting up at thy command, doing what God gave its instinct to do. She seeks her food from afar off. Hmm. We'd like to look at some of those things, some of the traits of an eagle. <clears throat> Going back to Genesis 1.21, the fifth day, it tells us that God created the fish of the sea, and he also created the fowls of the air. So we see that the eagle was created back on the fifth day. And as I think of the different uh, birds that, we see and we have, uh, we haven't been seeing too many birds in our, area, uh, in our backyard this summer because I haven't been feeding them. I, I, I guess to be honest with you, I just felt that the birds have enough with the rain and so forth that they can find their things. And there's many hungry people in the world that uh, cannot find food. And so I'm buying food for those rather than the birds. They, they're just going to have to do without or find their own food for the time being. Maybe when winter comes, I'll settle down and give them some opportunity to feed in my backyard. But anyhow, uh, lots of bird, cardinals, and just you name it. 
But you know, the grandest of these birds, it's not the biggest. You know, there's some, an ostrich is a fowl. Uh, they're pretty big too. But an eagle is the grandest of the flying birds. And there's a reason for it. There's the way God made it. And, and the things that, uh, that, that gave me the idea of entitling my message Lessons from the Eagle because it, the eagle has many things to tell us in relation to a Christian walk of life. God created eagles and he created man. And it's so interesting to see how that he duplicated a lot of the things in the eagle in man that he wants from man for his kingdom. <clears throat> Would like to notice its characteristics. It has superb strength. It has superb speed. A bald eagle is beautiful. Even the golden eagle is beautiful. If you just look real closely on the gold eagle, it looks like it's all brown, but really it gets its name because of its neck on up. As the bald eagle is white, the golden eagle is gold. And when the sun shines on it, it glows in, a, in that gold color. <clears throat> they have beautiful beauty. There is some, some validity. And they have majesty. We'd like to touch on these. It's no wonder it's called the king of birds. It's an image, its image is often found on coins, emblems, seals, and flags. And as we think of that, we think that there, or we understand that there's a certain respect given to an eagle. It's a great bird. Now some of the definitions here that I'm giving vary a little bit from book to book. But its wing spread is from 6 to 10 feet. 6 to 10 feet. I believe we have 10 feet to the eve, right? Paul? A wing spread. A bird. Would you want to have it land on your shoulder? It weighs about 10 pounds, approximately, according to the Cyclopedia. But the thing that's amazing is when it dives, when it's not flying or riding the, the wind waves or the air waves, it can dive at about 200 miles an hour. Can you imagine that? That's speedy. But you know something that's even more amazing is how does it slow down and stop without crashing? Amazing, God's creation. That's a swift bird. Jesus is also king. Is he king of your life? In John 1, verse 49, Nathaniel answered and said when he was talking to uh, the disciple, uh, to Jesus, he says, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. This also was told to Mary before Jesus was born, that he would be a king. He would lead his people, Israel. Jesus is king because he paid the price for our redemption for all people that believe. <clears throat> In Romans 5, I'd like to turn to that scripture. Romans 5, reading verses 17 and 18 in relation to Jesus being king. <clears throat> the word of God says, in relation to Jesus dying for our sins and being a, uh, a sacrifice for our redemption, it says in verse 17, for by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they 
which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by one offense of one, judgment came upon all men to, to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And if we go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, we'll see verification of that thought that was there where it says in verses uh, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Talking about the first man, Adam, and, and we have a better explanation in verses 45 to 47 where it tells us about that. In verse 45 in the same chapter, it talks in uh, 1 Corinthians, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, quote, Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. How be it? That was not first which was spiritual, but that which was, in, was natural, and afterward that which was spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. This is talking about Jesus, talking about the redemption that he wrought. All right, we'd like to look at the eagle's strength. Even though it's a big bird, it's not as big as a lot of other ones. Um, yet, its strength lies in its capabilities. They have strong legs and feet. They're called talons. They're big. But they have much strength in that. I tried to look up and find, and maybe with modern technology, I don't have that. We could, maybe someone can show us what that is. But I, I wondered what its grasp is capable of doing. How much power is in its grasp? It does tell us that it takes its prey and it squeezes it to death. Because when it comes and it takes it back to its nest, and it's dead when it comes back. It, it's not alive anymore. It has squeezed it to death. It has strong feet or talons. Crushes its victim to death and carries it to its nest. Then it picks it apart with its beak. Tears it apart. Its beak is approximately two inches long. It's a big beak. It's a big bird. <clears throat> Interesting, isn't it? Its prey includes rabbits, squirrels, and even baby deer and lambs. Tells us that it can carry and kill objects bigger than itself, which is very, as we read that thought there, it's very real that it can do that. We're, as I think of the capability of it, taking care of its prey. I think of the thought in relation, spiritually speaking, for us as Christians. We have an enemy. We have a, an adversary. And we are no match for him. We need God to help us because we are no match for Satan. John 10.10 10 tells us that he's out to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's what Satan is out to do. We are no match for him. We need a greater strength to comprehend, uh, to overcome that. And we have that through Jesus. Jesus was victorious over Satan's power. And if we are the children of his kingdom, we too can be victorious and be in his protection. An important part that contributes to its strength, I'd like to uh, bring out that was interesting to me as I was reading some of these books. <clears throat> That's its, the diet that the eagle has. 
you will find other birds, which are the ones I feed in my backyard and other places, they often find worms, berries, insects, and other things, you know, to sustain life. And even they have, there's casualties on the road that birds participate in, especially vultures. And uh, you will find that the eagle will only take its prey, kill it, and take it to its nest to eat it while it's still warm. It will not have, it, does have, it doesn't have any part in eating decomposed meat, meat that's already dead. They have fresh meat. Of course, the possibility of sickness is, is eliminated by eating fresh meat for the eagle. He also will feed that fresh meat to its young ones. Very interesting. <clears throat> Eagles choose what they want to eat. The interesting part about an eagle is he's up high. They build their nest up high on a rock. Up high in the cliffs. Many times as much as 10,000 feet up. Up there where the air is thin. And I didn't know it, but up there is where the air currents are more prevalent. Where they can fly and just, not fly, but just drift over clean air. <clears throat> As they're up there, it tells us that they choose their food and they see it and then they dive to get it. And then they have fresh meat. Vulture's diet is dead things, spoiled meat. Some other thoughts that were shared was the fact that they gorged themselves in that. They don't know when to quit. They sometimes continue eating to where they're not able to fly. So not only are they down on the ground looking for food down there instead of where the live meat is, they uh, become a prey themselves because they haven't practiced discipline in their lives. So they become something for the eagle to see and get warm meat. They become a prey. Another thing about the eagle is that he's up on high and he eats and no one else is around, solitary. He's up there where no other birds fly. And of course we know that spreading of diseases often happens when there's multiple uh, birds around, the vultures. How many times have you seen vultures eating a dead thing on, on the road? Are they alone? Not apt. There's usually three or four there. They're trying to get to it. And of course, the closer contact, the more apt to have diseases. Eagles often are healthy birds. The question comes as we think of the diet, what is your diet as, Christian, as a Christian? Is it the living word? Proverbs 4, 21, 20 and 21 says, My son, attend unto my words, incline thine ear unto thy, my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Life and health, that which the eagle desires. Is that what you desire? That will make us healthy Christians. Feeding on the word of God, the living word, that which expresses what our heart's desire needs and is and wants. In 1 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 4, it says, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, 
And, the, and that rock was Christ. That's the food that we need to be looking into. The, the New Testament has the living word. The Old Testament gives us much direction in relation to uh, the coming of the Messiah, the one that has the living word. That is the living drink, water of life. Are we feasting upon that? Or are we mixing in dead things, dead things the world has to offer, that which is on the ground, leftovers, that which seems to look good, but is filled with disease and will bring sickness to our spiritual lives. Poor spiritual diet means poor spiritual health. That's easy to understand. Another thought one gave. A sick eagle will not reproduce, nor will be able to contend with the enemy. God wants his children to have his kingdom grow. He wants growth. If we read uh, there in... Um, John 15, the parable of the vine and the branches. He asks, he trims the vine so that it brings forth more fruit. Even if it produces fruit, he trims it so that it brings, he wants growth from us. He doesn't want sick Christians. He wants us to grow. <clears throat> he wants us to reproduce, bring into the kingdom and as we see the wickedness of the world today, it makes us, gives us a greater burden to, as much as possible, bring into the kingdom those that do not know the true love of Jesus and to have them saved for eternity. Eternity stands before us, and we need to be ready. But we want to have others be ready also. Are, is that your heart's desire? It is mine. And I desire to see more added to the kingdom. I like to see reproduction. And we also need healthy bodies if we want to contend with the enemy. First Corinthians, or Colossians 1.10 is talking about the uh, reproduction. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. And then in Ephesians 6, 18, it talks about um, that of contending with the enemy. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having all to stand, contending with the enemy. We need the armor of God, and then we will be able, and we won't need to be afraid and fear when the enemy comes, because we have a, we have a power that far outweighs the enemy's power, the power of Jesus in our lives. Do we claim it? Is it a part of our life? We don't need to fear, but we can move on with confidence because God is with us. I'd like to look a few minutes at the vision of an eagle. We all know that many of the animals can see better than what mankind can, but the eagle is superb. Let's note its ability to focus. Wendell talked about focusing this morning. The eagle, likewise, has the ability to focus in a special way. One person, or one uh, book said that if a person, no, I think I've seen that in the encyclopedia. So I believe it could very possibly be real accurate. Hopefully, anyhow, if a person could have the eyesight as sharp as that of an eagle, he or she might be able to read a newspaper about a mile away. That's astounding. But the eagle at 10,000, 15,000 feet can see a fish in the water and dive for it. Isn't that amazing? And many times, the, the water is not very deep where fish are. 
diving at 200 miles an hour and getting the fish and not having a catastrophe. Amazing of God. Are we able to focus like that in relation to God's kingdom? Eagles can fly over 10,000 feet high, and from those heights, it will spot its dinner and dive to attain it. How sharp is my spiritual vision? Is it blurred because of unbelief? I think of Thomas. God and Thomas, we call him. John 20, verse 25, where he said, except, and this was after the resurrection, and they told him that Jesus is, raised, is not in the grave anymore. And, and, and so they were gathered together and, and they were telling each other that the disciples were. And Thomas says, except I see in his hand and the print of the nails and thrust my hand in his side, I will not believe. Blinded by spiritual vision? Lured, maybe, better. Not quite believing. Or do I, like the other disciples, have faith in believing that which I cannot see? They trusted that Jesus was alive. And of course, you read that story. Jesus appeared in the midst, in the houses. The doors were all locked. And all at once, Jesus was in the midst. And he said, Thomas. Put your hand in my side and see my hand, uh, nail prints in my hands. And then Thomas believed. But he was one who believed when he seen. Can we in faith believe without seeing? Blessed is he, the uh, psalmist says, <clears throat> that does not see and yet believes. I'm not sure that was psalmist. I think that was in the New Testament. I didn't look that up. Another example of the vision. A woman with an issue of blood felt she only needed to, in secret, touch the garment of Jesus and she would be healed. She had a vision of the Lord, a precise vision, a focused vision, a faith. And Jesus said to her, turned around, he felt it, and he complimented the woman for having that great faith. This is what he said to her, thy faith hath made thee whole, and she was healed. As we think of the eagle's eyes, the eagles have two sets of eyelids. One is a protection when flying, <clears throat> a type of clear shield. Remember, wouldn't, wouldn't it be good to have some shields in front of you when you're flying 200 mile an hour, diving? I think so. The second set of eyelids are like sunglasses, and it makes it possible for them to fly toward the sun and be able to see its object or its prey. That second set keeps it from being blinded. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 talks about how that we can, we see through a glass darkly, a type of sunglasses. We don't see everything. We don't understand everything just totally. But in faith, we believe it. And that doesn't detour us when we have that. Someday, we're going to be able to see face to face, and it will be all clear. And many of these things that seem so difficult for us, and we don't understand the end and how it's going to turn out. If we trust, we can be at rest. We can be at peace. We can glide along, resting in the assurance of God. Someday, it'll all be answered. Psalm 33, verses 13 and 14 says, the Lord looketh from heaven and beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon the inhabitants of the earth. Does that trouble you? 
Are you glad that God can look down and see where you are and what you're doing? Or does that trouble you? Our God is able. His almighty eye is able to see not only what you're doing, but he can see in your heart. He understands our heart. He knows what we're thinking. And I can't imagine. I was just, the last while, I, we've had so many, it seems like so many death experiences. Just a couple days ago, another death of our friend. Another one that won't be able to come to the River Forest reunion because she's met her maker. And as I think of that, and I think of all the graves of all these thousands of years, someday they will all come out of the graves. Even those that are in the sea that have thought that they could maybe disintegrate their body by burning and throwing and casting them out in the sea and God can't put them together. No, they don't have a vision of God. God is able to do that. Are we, do we have that kind of a vision? God is looking down and he knows where we are, what we're going through. <clears throat> Only when protected by the blood of Jesus are men able to approach the light. Unconverted Paul became blind when he saw the light. That was Jesus. But of course, that same Jesus then removed that blindness for him. And Paul was a different man. He was a converted man. And he, for the rest of his life, served and preached the truth. I'd like to mention one more thing. Or well, we could mention many more things. The spiritual example of the marriage union of the eagle is fascinating. They have a method they use in proving themselves of their worthiness for each other, a type of courtship. I'll just go through this. It says that the eagle gets a stick, a small stick, and he flies to 10,000 feet, and then up there he circles in the figure eight, while the male follows. Now this doesn't say that the male becomes subject to the servant or to the female, but it's the way that they courtship because the female is testing the male to see how diligent he is. Is he really worthy of her? So she takes his stick and she flies around up there and he's chasing her and then she drops it. And the eagle Male eagle goes down and he catches it. And then they, that process is over. And then a little later she goes and gets a bigger stick. And she goes back up. Yes, the male follows her. They do this over and over. The stick gets bigger and bigger. Finally the stick gets fairly large. But the male needs to catch it and grab it. And after that, after the female decides that he's worthy of her and he decides she's doing her part, they decide to get married, you might say, quote. They go up to ten to 15,000 feet and then they turn around and they clasp the talons together and they fall head over heels, down, 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 just rolling around and screaming in joy of their togetherness. That's their marriage ceremony. Then the second aspect, another aspect that we believe Scripture teaches, they are married, they're together for life. No more are they twain, but they are one flesh. They hunt together. They um, fly together. They have children, or, yeah, they have a family together. And if it needs be, which they often don't, they have to migrate because of the situation. They migrate together. They're together for life. 
And likewise, we know what our thoughts are, what Scripture teaches concerning uh, marriage is a sacred right, and only in death, and only death parts it. Mark ten nine. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Concerning divorce, Jesus said from the beginning it was not so, even though Moses had allowed it. Jesus changed that. There are so many similarities. And we don't have, I have, I'm going to, another thing that I'd like to just touch on, and that's in, in the area of the young ones in their nest. Their nest is way up there on the cliff, a big nest, probably 10 foot in diameter. And that's where the young ones are raised. And, and when it comes time that it, there are no more little chicks, little babies, eaglets. They have feathers, and it's time for them to learn to fly. And I think some mention has been made about this already. You can read it in Psalms where it talks about the eagle coming in, and he ruffles up the nest, and he shakes them all up. The little eaglets think, oh, what's happening here, Mom? What's wrong with you? Are you insane? And, and she keeps ruffling him up, and the father, they call out to the father that's flying around up above him, or drifting around up there, but he doesn't come and help. And the mother keeps taking him to the edge, and all at once, she pushes him off, off the edge, and they fall. And they don't know what to do. They've been observing their mom and dad flying all these times. But they don't know. They're falling. They're afraid. And they start flapping their wings, and they try to learn how to fly, and, and, and they learn a little bit, but they keep falling. And the closer, and the, closer, the closer they get to the ground, the more they try and flap their wings and try and fly. But it's not working. It's just the first time. And all at once, here comes the father, and he flies under them, and they land on, their, on his back. And he takes them back up to the nest. Only for lesson number two. Soon mom pushes them out again, and then they fall. And finally, after time after time, they learn to fly, and they become a real eagle. They can carry on for their own selves. As we think of that as a Christian, God sometimes brings those things on in our lives to teach us so that we learn how to be more faithful, the part of being pruned so that we bring forth more fruit and more fruit so that God can be pleased. I'm going to close with that. There are, if you read the books or if you get some books, you'll find that there are so many other things that we don't have time to say and deliberate on this morning that relate to our Christian walk of life. It's so amazing to see how God used his own creation of the eagle and birds to demonstrate his love toward us and how that we as Christians walk according to his will how he wants us to walk according to his will, and how we can be taught to live successfully. Shall we kneel in prayer? For those who want to. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before thee, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for these illustrations that you give us. Help us to understand and learn more from your word. It's a living word, and it gives us the strength to be strong and healthy so that we can fight the enemy, that we can resist him by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for being with us and guide us as we continue on in these latter days to be faithful and to draw all men unto you, Lord, so that there might be a great reunion in heaven someday. We commit it all to you. Bless 
and keep thy word in our hearts and lives and give us wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.